Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 228, featuring a review of Might and Magic 10 Legacy. Now, as you probably know, I'm a big fan of the Might and Magic series, particularly the 6th, 7th, and 8th games. So when I heard that a 10th one was out, of course I wanted to check it out and see if it indeed lives up to the Might and Magic Legacy. Anyway, it's a really great game and I had a lot of fun with it. So without further ado, here is Might and Magic 10. And here we go with a little game called Might and Magic 10 Legacy. This wasn't designed by the New World Computing Group. Instead, this was uh, out of Germany, a little company called Limbic Entertainment. Uh, Julian Perot, I believe, is the creative director on this. and He says he was inspired by the old uh, Might and Magic 4. That's what he wanted to go for here. I didn't get into the series until 6. That was the Mandate of Heaven, and definitely one of my favorite CRPGs of all time. Now this is not quite like that, as you'll see this will have the Grimrock style movement. We'll get into that in a minute. Now you can create your own party, which I strongly advise. I never like to see people go with those pre-made parties, because half the fun is, you know, tailoring your game, creating the characters you want to play with. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of options here at the start. Uh, later on you'll be able to tweak these guys considerably, but Basically, you're just choosing a race, and then you've got three of these sort of uh, classes, I guess, little templates for you. You probably want to avoid the ranged classes, like the rangers or anything that emphasizes the bow. Uh, there's really not a lot of opportunities for that in this game, so just stick to the melee classes and the mages. You want something that looks kind of like a, a healer. Now, with the Might Magic games, there's not a lot of... It's not quite as rigid, so you can have a mage or a wizard or druid, whatever you want to call it, and they're more than likely both have the option to learn some healing spells as well as lots of damage spells and uh, stuff like that. So don't get too fixated on trying to recreate that tank, DPS, healer, trinity here. <laughs> it's a lot more flexible, a lot more versatile than that. It's pretty cool, too, how they've each class has its own little special abilities that uh, none of the other classes have. So that would really improve the replay value. I'm just looking at some of them here. And it, it's kind of interesting. It would actually change the gameplay, a couple of these. So did a pretty good job. I'm sure that's going to add to the replay value. If you want to play the game again later with a different party, you wouldn't just be using those same abilities over and over again. So kudos to them for that. Okay, so I'll go with these, uh, this dwarf here. Choose me! Not choosing me would be a mistake. <laughs> Man, I, I miss stuff like this. Choose me! Not choosing me would be a mistake. I mean, you can really start to tell here that, yeah, you're not dealing with a company that had a huge budget to work with. I mean, very few character models. I think all they did was change the, the wig out on a couple of these and... <laughs> Call it a new, uh, a new uh, character portrait, but you'll forget about that stuff soon enough once you get into the game. Now here's the some really important decisions. Now it's not that big of a deal because you can always pick up all these other skills that you don't learn right away later on. Uh, but you, what you do want to pay attention to though are the 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 skills, the little uh, symbol underneath the skills. If it's only got one bar, that means you can only take it up to expert level. If it's got two, you can take it up to master level. If it's got three, you can take it all the way to grand master. So each of the different classes will have those certain skills that can take all the way to the top. So what you might want to do is just think about what skills you want and then choose the appropriate class uh, based on that. You notice some things are grayed out completely, so I can't learn those. Uh, fortunately, though, uh, even though I'm going to be casting lots of spells with her, I can learn medium armor, which is pretty nice. You only take it up to... Uh, expert level, but that, that'll probably be fine. Uh, one thing about this game, everybody's always getting attacked. You know, there's no back row, <laughs> no place to hide. Uh, there's a little bit of tanking, taunting uh, that you can do, but uh, suffice it to say, you probably want to avoid that uh, squishy as much as possible. Make sure everybody's at least got some leather armor on. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to be uh, dying a lot. Nothing uh, too unusual with these uh, stats. Obviously, with the mage, you want to focus on magic and spirit. Magic controls how powerful the spells are, and the spirit, how much mana she has to draw from. 
And again, uh, I kept running out, so I don't think there's anything wrong with putting a lot of points into Spirit. Uh, the other stats, you know, of course, that'll depend on what class you're playing. Uh, the only stat I would avoid is the Perception. It's advised in some of the guides I looked at that at least one character needs to have a fairly high Perception to be able to spot traps and things, but... Choose me! That's not going to be important for most characters. Now, paradoxically, though, it's not a bad idea at all to make sure that each one of your characters has at least some type of melee skill and some type of ranged skill, bow or crossbow. Because, again, you need something to do when you run out of mana. And it is kind of annoying if the monsters are far off and you just have to defend. You don't have anything you can peg them with. All you need is just one point, and you can use a crossbow or a bow. So uh, The mages will have these things they call uh, magical foci or focus kind of a disc or a staff. It's a little confusing, but just keep in mind you don't really need to have a, a melee weapon with them. Alright, so let's go ahead and skip into the game and see what it's all about. What is the meaning of a dream? Only Asher knows. Are they omens warning us of future tragedies? Distant memories dying in the deafening silence of the void? Or are they sometimes both? The death wish of some ancestor bargaining with the dragons that his legacy be carried on. Last night I dreamed such a clear vision of past events. Terrible things I had wanted to forget. They refused to fade away. Demanding, pleading to be told one last time. This story begins with what we now call Uriel's Deception. During the fabled Elder Wars, wars that once pitched the Children of the Light against the Children of Darkness. Uriel, the great Archangel, had vowed to avenge his family. Slaughtered by the greatest warrior and tactician of the Faceless, Erebos, the Master of Assassins. For centuries, Uriel, consumed by hatred, planned his revenge. Shortly before the Second Eclipse, Uriel and his Inquisitors provided proof that the Faceless were plotting to rekindle the fire. <laughs> yeah, they really kind of hit you with this metric ton of exposition right at the beginning. Uh, they're trying to connect all the dots, I guess, from all the previous Might and Magic games. I mean, to tell you the truth, it's been long enough, and I never really paid that much attention to it anyway. <laughs> but I guess all this is here if you uh, really want to delve into it. Uh, but I'd just rather... Skip it and get to the good stuff. Do not let the name Raiders fool you. They were not mere brigands or adventurers only interested in glory and gold. They believed in a higher calling, an ideal of honor and courage. These values were the legacy of their mentor, Owen, a raider himself and a veteran of the Battle of Hammer Fall. In a way, it was also their mentor who had led them to the Ajin Peninsula. He had been a son of Carthal, and before his tragic death, he had asked his students to bring back his ashes to the city of his birth, to be buried next to his ancestors. To honor their master's wish, they boarded the first ship willing to take them to the west. As they disembarked in the small, peaceful harbor of Sorpigal by the sea, they could not suspect how far this journey was going to take them. Yeah, there you go. Love that opening shot there. A lot of nostalgia if you're a fan of the Might and Magic games. I hear Sir Christian. He's not going to take you. It's not going to be as easy as just taking this boat over to the place where you're supposed to deposit the ashes. Come <laughs> on, you didn't think it'd be that easy. <laughs> now we got to go explore this town. Now you'll notice it might look like it's continuous movement on your end, uh, but really we got this sort of grid-based movement going on. It's very similar to uh, the Grimrock game, Legend of Grimrock. So everything's turn-based. I just take a look here. Okay, so she's got a spear and this is this uh, orb I was telling you about that. Uh, what they call it, the arc, uh, magical focus. So it's probably what you want to use because it concentrates the magic a little bit. Unfortunately, this guy <laughs> he doesn't have any uh, any weapons at all. So first time I level him, I'm going to have to try to get some 
uh, a weapon skill, so he'll have a stick to hit somebody with. Is that just standing around looking dumb when he runs out of mana? So. Ah, new faces. Very good. I suppose you arrived with the morning tide, with that boat from the east. Welcome to Sopagal by the Sea. You're raiders, are you not? Adventurers? Yeah. I don't know what they were going for with this character. Oh, I guess the news of the current situation hasn't reached the rest of the world yet. Nobody is going in or out of Carthal, my friends. Yes. Onward. Bored already. <laughs> my sentiments exactly. What Get the hell away from this guy. Dunstan. All right. And here we go. Just like in the good old games, uh, if you see a barrel, usually we'll have a liquid in there that will raise one of your stats permanently. It really is always a good idea, even in real life, when you see a barrel full of liquid, just go ahead and yes. pop the lid off and take a swig. It's not going to hurt you. All right, here's Maximus, the Welcome man in aboard. charge. A lot of these NPCs, uh, the quest givers, will actually join your party for a while. You can have two in the party at any uh, one time, and they'll usually provide some pretty cool benefits, some perks. Now, this guy will slaves will help, but not for free. <laughs> this guy will block a lot of the attacks for you. Should be pretty uh, useful because we're going to be fighting spiders, just like in Might and Magic Seven. We're going to be getting poisoned a lot. Uh, fortunately, this game does load you up with a lot of uh, elixirs or antidotes, but it won't hurt to try to get that cure poison spell and whatever you can do to protect yourself against poison. Now let's take a look at the weapon shop. Ah, good old weapon shops. Yeah, I know you were hoping for the blacksmith from Hercules, but alas, it's just an old bearded guy. I just had to make some notes of what where this stuff is so I can come back later. Uh, one nice thing about the the uh, tile-based movement, the grid-based movement, though, it really makes it easy to get around. Uh, it's got that auto map there. It looks just like graph paper. Very handy. And there's also a lot of uh, great lore in this game. You notice there's these uh, books you can pick up here and there, and it's really just lavishly illustrated. I mean, it looks great. I mean, I think they did a better job with the, the books in this game than they did in Skyrim. I mean, a lot of attention to detail, a lot of fun stuff you can read about the, the game world. A lot of these NPCs you can't interact with, but so you just have to look around the map. The ones with the white dots uh, you can talk to. Sometimes they just gossip with you, but sometimes they'll have quests for you. And uh, some will be trainers, too. You may remember from the other Might and Magic games, you don't automatically train. Uh, you can level up a skill, but when it gets to a certain point, you have to find an expert trainer and then a master and grandmaster trainers to advance them. And these guys could be anywhere, so you really need to take make take some notes as you go along. You can use the notes in the on the map or just actual sheet of paper somewhere. Box no slaves will help, but not for free. Because there's nothing more annoying than when you're you finally got that skill up high enough to to level it, then you forgot. Where the heck is the shield expert trainer <laughs> going to three or four different towns trying to find him? Uh, so just write it down. You'll thank me later. Okay. So you can actually have this little goblin join the party. Uh, he will basically provide the benefits of an inn. So whenever you rest, you'll be well rested and have a nice bonus. Another NPC I found uh, would hunt food for you. And other ones will help you with uh, deal with the merchants. Once you hire one, you can always fire them as well. I'm just going to pick them back up later. So I think it's kind of fun to experiment. Try some different bonuses, uh, see what you think. Uh, these fountains are good when you want to buff up your health and mana. And those are kind of conveniently located. They're sprinkled here and there out in the, out in the peninsula, so you don't always have to rest. Take a look at the map. Just kind of want to explore the place, make sure I've got all the quests. Uh, one cool thing about this uh, game is you don't have to have the quest in order to get the quest items. So sometimes you'll just pick up, you'll be in a dungeon somewhere and you'll pick up something 
it's a quest item and then uh, later on you might find the quest giver and they'll just automatically just get credit for it which I much prefer that I always hated uh, World of Warcraft where you had to <laughs> go back to the area you just cleared to kill the boss again lots of different trainers here they're usually and this game is no exception there'll be a couple of skills that you won't be able to find until later on so just because you can't find it here don't don't panic uh, you'll probably get to it once you get to the next town uh, that happened to me with the shields the chapel of faith <laughs> don't really want to go to church <laughs> uh, that's where you can get resurrected or cured or learn light light magic all right. Anyway, let's get in. Let's get down that well and check out the first dungeon. I don't know if you noticed that little smart-ass remark that, that the uh, garrison commander gave me back there. But we're not going to send you down into a cellar to kill rats. Yeah, I wanted to go into a cellar and kill some rats. I said we got to go inside the well and kill some spiders. A uh, bestiary entry. Well, that's another cool thing. It, you have a little journal, and it'll keep track of what you learn about monsters as you go along. And if you kill enough of them, you'll start to learn their weaknesses, their special abilities, and you can tailor your attack. A lot of times, a battle that's just really tough, if you have the right kind of ward up, like if you know they're throwing poison damage at you, or not poison damage, if, if they're throwing like earth spells at you or dark spells, you can activate your ward and nullify a lot of that, so... You definitely want to pay attention to the type of creature you're fighting. Yeah, you know, look at the look at the attention to, de to detail in that journal. You got the critter there; it's animated. All of the stuff nicely arranged. I think they really did a good job on the, the interface here. It looks nice. You can definitely tell these guys weren't just slapping this together. You know, some love went into it. Now, some of these spells aren't really all that useful. Uh, again, it's like they really wanted the range stuff to be more important. You got a lot of stuff that'll freeze enemies in place and blow them back. And stuff like that, but I just didn't really find it very useful. Better off just trying to burn this stuff down. Protect yourself. Ah, here we go, the old poisonings. Uh, so, like I said, thank God they gave you lots of antidotes, because you're going to be quaffing those. If you don't get rid of that poison, you'll, your health will start to drop pretty fast. And it is possible, of course, to die in this game. You may just go unconscious and you can just rest and recuperate, but if the character actually dies, then you got to go back to the temple, pay 100 gold, and have him resurrected. It's a bit of a pain, so uh, I would just be, try to be quick with the antidotes. And don't be afraid to take the healing pots, the mana pots. Uh, they give you tons and tons of potions. So you really don't have to be conservative with that. Yeah, I don't know what it's like on that hard difficulty level, but uh, at least at this level, I never ran out of potions. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy, though. <laughs> Some of these monsters will kill you so fast, you don't have time to take the potions. Ah, uh, here we go. I just rested for eight hours. Something is coming our way. Be ready. I never got in trouble with resting. I think you get interrupted once in a while, but I never did. And here is the Spider Queen. Big baddie. Now one thing about this game, it's definitely not a, a hand holder. I mean, these boss fights are tough. And they don't hold your hand very well either when you're out exploring. It's quite possible to come upon a really advanced a set of monsters and they'll just annihilate you. So you want to be in the habit, it's like back in the back in the day, just constantly saving. Keep a couple different saves going. You never know when you'll get yourself into an unwinnable situation. Well, they might scare some people off, but uh, you know, it just makes you makes you play a little bit smarter. And if you die a couple times, so what? Just reload. Yeah, look at the health on the Spider Queen. <laughs> oh man, I don't know if I'm going to survive this. A lot of these battles, I I just you know, you're right on the seat of uh, edge of your seat. A lot, of a lot of the battles, I uh, just had one guy left, and then I had to go all the way back out, all the way back to town with just that one dude to try to resurrect everybody else. So, definitely the, a fun difficulty. Thank God for these spellcasters. 
They'll definitely do most of the damage for you. you run out of mana quick. You can always take a pot, throw some more fireballs. Oh, this is gonna be close. Oh, come on. Yeah! Oh! Yeah! <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Look at the way that spider just curled up like that. Oh, yeah. That's sad. This is satisfying gameplay right here. And this is just good stuff. Now, you'll notice uh, that I completed the battle, but that battle music's still going. Uh, yeah. Uh, I couldn't get it to stop. I even went into the settings and turned, tried to turn off the music and turn off the sound. It just kept on playing. Couldn't make it. I finally had to quit it, quit the game and reload. So, definitely some bugs in here. No pun intended. Let's take a look at all my options here. You notice if you get them up to those little bumps on the bar, that's where you have to go get your training. And usually you get a very nice perk when you hit those as well. You know, some of the really cool stuff won't kick in until you get to the expert master level. But sometimes it, it might be an item that you can't equip unless you're an expert. Or a spell you can't cast until you're expert or master. The red stuff is not the stuff that hasn't been identified. You can't put it on. You either have to go pay to have it identified or use your identity identify spell, which I don't have yet. So anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and show you my other party just so you get a some look at the later game. You get some pretty good variety with the different locations too. I mean I've been playing for a good two days, and I don't even feel like I'm even halfway done with it. So you definitely get a lot for your $25. The only, you know, there are some problems with the graphics engine. A few people have pointed those out in reviews. Uh, you get a lot of stuttering sometimes. Uh, if you see a lake or water sometimes, it just about <laughs> brings you down, brings your computer to a crawl. And even on a fairly advanced machine here, so that's something to consider. I don't really think that they fine-tune this engine as much as they could have. Ah, the chest. Sometimes these chests this have riddles that you have to, to solve to open them. I really love that. It reminds me of the old Betrayal of Crondor days. Now, here's a little AI trick, too. If you just stand out in the middle of the room, you know, you get pinged by mages and archers, and you can get eaten up pretty fast that way. If you make them back up into a corner where they they just show up like this, you can get them all into a nice cluster, and then mow them down with your AOEs. <laughs> Come in with that little side step. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. Is this is this cheating to kind of manipulate the AI like this? I maybe, but some of the battles seem so tough. I don't really know how you could, how you do it otherwise. And I think there is something to be said for trying to use some strategy. I love that poison spray. That's the earth spell. It's great. I love the fireball, too. Really, I think the earth school of magic is just... I found that to be the most useful of all. Because you got a really nice heal. And really nice damage. Uh, fire. You have the fireball. And then there's a little fire... Single target fire spell. That's pretty good. You know, I'm sure each one of the, each of the trees probably has its useful stuff. Uh, the only thing that I was a little disappointed, I didn't see the flight spell. Usually that's the, once you get the air school leveled up enough, you can just fly. I really hope they have it in this game. I'm not getting my hopes up too high, though. All right, so there we go. Very tough battle. I just, you know, the, as you get into this game, uh, it definitely gets very, very difficult. Some of these dungeons would be three or four levels, and you get to the by the time you get to the bottom of it or the top of it, you're you know, you're completely out of food, and you have to go all the way back to town. All right, here's a secret passage, and you'll you'll see you have to go through a couple of trials to get it open. I think that's where the perception score comes in. But you'll find some really awesome stuff this way. Unfortunately, I already have an awesome artifact shield. Uh, you get the artifacts in this game actually level up, so you probably want to hold on to those. Uh, they'll level up with your character and get better over time. 
So overall, I have no problems recommending this game. I personally really, really enjoy it. Lots of uh, fun here. I, it's just kind of a no-brainer. I mean, $25, uh, you're going to be spending a lot of fun time, fun quality time with this game. Now, as far as the legacy of Might and Magic, does it hold up? Uh, I don't... You know, I'm kind of having a hard time with that question. I mean, to me, this feels more like Legend of Grimrock meets uh, Might and Magic more than, uh, you know, the next logical progression for the series. I... Not really too sure how I feel about this grid-based movement for a Might and Magic game. I was a huge fan of Mandate of Heaven. I, feel so I just thought it made the whole game feel more immersive. Uh, I know that the older Might and Magics were just like this with a turn-based movement. And some people prefer that. I just, you know, don't really happen to be one of them. <laughs> it's fine, I guess. Although I really would have liked there to have seen what they could do. If they had had the ambition of those guys back in the, the 90s to really try to take the technology to a new level uh, rather than just basically copy the Grimrock approach. No, you know, I have nothing against the Grimrock guys. I mean, they did a great job. It's a fun game, but I'm just not 100% sold on the idea that it was the right approach to take for this game. But, you know, for what it is, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you'll get used to the turn-based, uh, grid-based movement after a while. You won't even really be thinking too much about it. And they did a great job with the leveling and the skills. There's lots of stuff I'm looking forward to finally getting and trying out. And the difficulty is, is just right. It's, it's very challenging. It's not just impossible. Uh, but you will be reloading a few times. I mean, these, these are high-stakes battles. It's very exciting stuff. You don't feel like you're just bored. Uh, wandering around the, the dungeon down. killing mob after mob. I mean, it's it's, it's very well-balanced gameplay in my opinion. So just to kind of sum this up, if you're on the fence about it, uh, my advice would be if you like The Legend of Grimrock, I don't see why you wouldn't like this game. Um, if you like the older Might and Magic games, uh, there's enough of that spirit here that I think you'll appreciate it. If nothing else, you get a little, little of the uh, nostalgic factor kicking in and that'll be enough to you know, encourage you to keep playing. I don't think they knocked it out of the park by any means. Out. There's definitely some areas of this game that I thought could use a little bit the more attention. Uh, the engine itself has a few glitches in it. Not as smooth as I would like. Uh, the AI, a bit questionable at times. Uh, some of the situations like this here, they love to put you in these situations where you're stuck right in the middle uh, getting blasted uh, from all sides. So that can get... You know, you can either look at it as being a real challenge or just really annoying. You know, I guess this is the sort of thing right here that uh, they couldn't really do very effectively with that pre-flowing movement, so... I guess, you know, I'll give them credit for trying to work with this model. Now, one thing I'm definitely hoping for is when I actually complete this thing, it'll throw up that little certificate of completion so I can print that out and post it on the wall. Some of you guys will know what I'm talking about. So anyway, here we go. Might Magic 10. The Legacy. I'll post the links to it on the show notes if you want to check it out for yourself. No! It can't be! And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a new interview series, this time with Stuart Chaffee of the... A uh, famous television show, Computer Chronicles. Stewart has hundreds of just amazing stories about computers and uh, video game history, so you'll definitely want to stay tuned. Uh, stay tuned for that. As always, I want to thank you very, 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 very much, guys, if you have supported me either on PayPal or on Patreon. Now, if you haven't checked out this Patreon site, I strongly encourage you to go check it out. A lot of great uh, YouTube shows on there, blogs, podcasts. I mean, people are doing all kinds of stuff. And it's a really fun way to contribute to the show. I think you get a little bit more bang for your buck than you would with uh, just using PayPal. Uh, so please uh, go check that out if you haven't already. Uh, now, what about that ale of the week? Well, uh, this week I don't have an ale. I've got something uh, a little more unusual. This is a <laughs> raw organic live soda kombucha called Dr. Better. <laughs> you know, I like Dr. Pepper. Apparently this is, uh, I don't know if this is supposed to taste like Dr. Pepper or, or what, but uh, I wanted to see. Uh, this is brewed in Austin, Texas, and it's got the, the, the kombucha in it, which is my understanding is a big mushroom. 
I don't know if I'm going to be hallucinating after this or what. Uh, less than half the sugar, so I guess they're trying to build this as kind of a healthy alternative to, to soda pop. But anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this live soda, Dr. Better here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I noticed there's some, <laughs> some kind of funk on the bottom of this bottle. I hope it's supposed to be like that. Oh, it smells really good. Uh, I don't really know what that smells like. It's kind of a, kind of a citrusy, like a, uh, uh, like a grapefruit like uh, scent to it. There's a lot of fizz with this. It's very, <laughs> indeed, live. But anyway, let's give it a taste. <laughs> what the heck am I drinking here? Uh, it does taste a little bit like Dr. Pepper. Um, man, that is weird. I wonder if it's got some... It tastes like it's got some kind of uh, sweetener in it, like aspartame or something. Let's see, kombucha, stevia. Yeah, I thought I thought I detected some of that stuff. You know, I'm not a big fan of those artificial sweeteners. I mean, just just give me the sugar, please. Um, it's kind of got that uh, those sort of artificial sweeteners. They always kind of have a metallic uh, aftertaste. I don't really enjoy. <sighs> but it does definitely. They definitely got a little bit of a, a Dr. Pepper taste to it. I really, more than anything, this just tastes like a, a sort of watered-down uh, diet Dr. Pepper. So I'm not really very impressed with the Dr. Better. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to just go, uh, I guess, zero out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, just get a Dr. Pepper instead. I think you'll be much happier. Anyway, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking for quotations about magic, you know, to go with the whole might and magic theme. And I found this one from uh, Tom Robbins that I really liked. Disbelief in magic can force a poor soul into believing in government and business. <laughs> See you guys next week. Oh, now you're going to shoot me in my pinky.